stands up and warns his disciples. You, my disciples, many of you will come before me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and I say, depart from me, I never knew you. He wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to those who said they believed on his name. And that's why he's given these countless warnings. He said, you are true believers. You do have eternal life. And one of the evidences will be, if you do, is that you will continue in my word. Are you? I beg you to scrutinize your life tonight. To ask yourself, has my relationship with the word of God changed? Is God teaching me through the Word? Do I have a desire for the Word? And am I growing in holiness? Can I see any progress? It's a great question, isn't it? Is there any evidence? I want you to think about this. The other night, our uh, man who works in music in the church, he was teaching a group of people, and my wife was in the group, and someone mentioned uh, the song, The Little Lord Jesus Lies Sleeping in the Hay, or whatever that song is. And the youth, uh, the music man, he, he wanted to make a point. He goes, Little, little, has anyone ever read the Bible? We ought to say, The Massive Lord Jesus. Now, it really just doesn't work out right. But I, you get his point? I want you to think about something. This massive, infinite creator of all things. It is taught today that he can be received through a tiny little prayer and never change a person's life at all. It is taught that he who began a good work in the believer won't necessarily finish it. It is taught, even maybe among you, that you can live just like the world, look like the world, love the things of the world, everything else, but you got Jesus. That's not true. Now again, I want to iterate something so important. We are saved only by faith in Jesus Christ and not of works lest any man should boast. But salvation is a supernatural work of God whereby the very nature of a human being is changed. They become a new creature. They become a child of God. And the evidence that this miraculous thing has happened is they begin to continue in His Word and grow in His Word and more and more set free from the power of sin. Is that you? Now let's go on and look at another test. Go to John 15. A test of true discipleship. Verse 1, I am the true vine and my father the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. What does that mean? Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Matthew 7 agrees with this teaching. Do you see what he's saying? Someone who pretends to be a branch. Someone who considers himself a branch. Someone who tells the world he is a branch. Someone who's been told by religious authorities that he is a branch. But he bears no fruit. He will be taken away by the Father and he will be burned. That's what it's saying. It's not saying that everyone who prays the prayer is going to heaven. It says everyone who doesn't bear fruit is damned. Why? Because we're saved by fruit keeping? No. Because fruit or fruit bearing? No. Because fruit bearing is the evidence of truly having believed unto salvation. Do you bear fruit? Do you? Because he says in verse 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Do you bear fruit? Look what he's saying. Look at this verse. 
My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so, In this way, how? In bearing fruit, you prove to be my disciples. That's the same thing he's teaching. What? A tree is known by its fruit. By its fruit. By its fruit. I go into Baptist churches and other churches, Lutheran churches, all sorts of evangelical churches, and I I come into contact with young people who have been so deceived. They bear no fruit. Yet they're assured of their salvation, as sure as sure can be. They're never pruned by the Father. There's no evidence of God working in their life. They can flagrantly be involved in sin and have no conviction of sin and then participate in the youth group on Sunday morning with no problem whatsoever. And they're still assured that they are truly born again. That is not true. Jesus said, by your fruit you prove to be my disciples. And then he goes in verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain and that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. How can we be assured that the true Christian will always bear fruit? First of all, because salvation is a work of God. That true disciple did not choose Jesus so much as Jesus chose him. And not only chose him, but appointed him, predestined him, ordained him to do what? To go and bear fruit. And that's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. We are his workmanship. He has created for every believer good deeds that he will walk in. That he will do. You see, here's what I want you to see. Salvation is more about God than it is about you. It's more about God's reputation and God's glory than anything else. God is demonstrating something in the land that He is powerful to save and that everyone He truly saves, He will truly transform. He is demonstrating His power by what He does in the life of every believer. That's why it's absolutely absurd to think that a man can truly be saved and then live in a constant state of carnality. It's absolutely absurd. Because it's saying that God who had the power to begin the work does not have the power to finish it. And that's not true. So what is one of the great evidences that a person is truly converted? They will bear fruit. They will bear fruit. Now let me ask you a question. Do you bear fruit? Let me ask you a question. Do you bear secret fruit? Hidden fruit. What do I mean by that? Not that it's hidden from the world, but that when it's fruit that flows forth from your character and not from your circumstance. It's when you are alone and no one's with you. Do you bear fruit? Only, or are you only religious in your youth group? on the days of your church gatherings, when you're alone at school, when you're a long way from the religious, do you bear fruit? Do you walk in holiness? Do you desire God? Can the fruit of the Spirit, according to the book of Galatians, be seen in your life? Is there any evidence, other than the fact you claim to be a Christian, is there any evidence that you truly are? Look at the sovereignty of God here. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. He's saying, I want you to know something. You are my work. You are my branch. You reflect my power. You are the instrument I will use to gain glory for myself. I will do a work in you. And not only will I be working in you, the Father will be working in you. For those of you who are truly my disciples and bear fruit, the Father will prune you and cut you and discipline you and do everything that is absolutely necessary so that you bear more fruit. If you can run wild like a dog off a leash, if you can live in the world and play religious on Sunday and Saturday nights when there's a youth group, 
If there's no evidence of God disciplining you and convicting you of sin and trying you and testing you and working in you, then be afraid. Be very afraid. For He has said that everyone who bears fruit, the Father will prune. And everyone who does not bear fruit, the Father will take away in judgment. How many of you tonight would be taken away in judgment? Regardless of your confession, regardless of what you say with your mouth, there's no fruit. Now, let's go to one more test. John 13. Verse 34. A new commandment I will give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. One of the greatest evidences of truly being Christian, of truly being born again, is that your affections will not only be turned to the Lord, but they will be returned to the Lord's people. You will have a deep abiding love for the people of God. Prior to my conversion, I hated Christians. I made fun of Christians. I scoffed at Christians. I mocked Christians. On the day of my conversion, everything changed. I wanted to be with Christians. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be with Christians? And if you say yes, then I have to ask another question. What kind of Christian? I was hearing the testimony of one fellow who was saying that a dear friend of his was in the music, Christian music scene, and that many, many of the Christian musicians and instrument players and such, many of them are lost and, and call themselves lost, but they're very talented musicians. And one of them told a friend of mine, man, I tell you, I love playing in this Christian band because, man, the Christians have the best parties. But at the same time, I mean, you see the same thing. 